Laura Noll était un orateur régulier de la John Birch Society en 1962 à 1963. Voici la première partie d'un de ses discours. Ce discours est intitulé « Cuba Betreid ». Laura Noll était membre de l'équipe paramilitaire Interpun de Jerry Patrick Heming, qui effectuait des raids sur le Cuba de Castro. Comme Jerry Heming, Larry Howard, Frank Sturgis et Harry Dean, Laura Noll était un partisan de Castro avant de devenir un ennemi de Castro. Tout au long de 1963, Jerry Patrick Heming et Laura Noll ont rendu visite à l'ex-général Edwin Walker à Dallas à plusieurs reprises. Sylvia Audio affirme avoir vu Lee Harvey Oswald en compagnie de deux Cubains, le 25 septembre 1963. Le FBI a interrogé Laura Noll à propos de cette observation, et, dans un premier temps, Laura n'a admis avoir rendu visite à Sylvia Audio, avec Larry Howard et un Angelo, mais pas Lee Oswald. Lorsqu'Audio a refusé de changer son histoire, Laura Noll a alors affirmé que ce n'était pas Sylvia Audio qu'il avait visité ce jour-là. En septembre 1968, Laura Noll a admis au National Inquirer qu'on lui avait offert 50 000 dollars à Dallas fin octobre 1963 pour assassiner Kennedy. Une offre qu'il aurait refusée. I am a Cuban freedom fighter. I am here bringing to the American people a two-part message. Number one, to tell a story of what I saw, lived and breathed concerning Cuba and the actions of our government. Number two, to try to awaken the mass of citizens of the United States to the treacherous dealings in which our government has betrayed not only the Cubans, but each and every American. I became involved in the revolution in Cuba when I by chance went to Havana, Cuba on vacation. I became acquainted with a 15-year-old bellhop at the St. John Hotel. He in turn took me to Camilo Sanfuegos who was a commandant movement, which was the movement headed by Fidel Castro. I then became a captain in the revolution, and when the revolution was over, and we were on our way down to Havana, the rapings of women, of innocent people from trees, I've witnessed people laying in the streets with their heads bashed in from rifle butts given to these people through the militia, or at that time the rebel army. Then I witnessed the 18,000 Cuban children between the ages of 12 and 16 that were sent to Russia and Czechoslovakia for the purpose of going through a four-year communist indoctrination school. Then there was the agrarian reform. The agrarian reform plan was a plan to which the supposedly give to each compensino or workman that would be their own. Loads of that were arriving in spoke Spanish but they were not Cubans. They were being hauled out to the Ciudad Libertad and to other military installations throughout Cuba. I later on found out that these were the same Spanish people taken from Spain during the communist takeover in Spain. Then the forfeiture of all human dignity of the Constitution, and they then instilled upon the peace of justice by the military tribunals, the news media. These same United States that I seen come to front in Cuba in 1959. And I'm running scared. I also seen the trials. These trials would last from two to five minutes. There would be a three-man tribunal. They would bring the accused in before the three-man tribunal. They would ask him his name, rank, and serial number, and organization that he was with, an area that he was in. Whereupon the officers would present a three or a four or a five page uh, documentation signed either by thumbprint or by an X or by a signature from some Cuban that stated that this man had committed this atrocity. He was found guilty and immediately taken to La Cabana, where sometime during the night or the early hours of the morning, he would be taken to the wall and executed. Then came the trial. Now this was an open public trial that was to be held. They had saved all of the generals and the colonels and the majors and the captains for this particular trial. The trial was held at the ballpark. The ballpark seats 50,000 people. It's in downtown Havana on the corner of 23rd and L Street. On the day of the trials, they had approximately 75,000 people packed into these stands. 
They built a special stand out in the middle of the ballpark. They dug three holes in the ground and planted three poles. They would haul the individual officers up to the stand before the three-man tribunal, asking their name, rank, and serial number and organization or area that they were in charge of. Upon tribunal officer would find them guilty. He would then turn to the audience and ask them what the penalty should be, whereupon the answer would be, pare don, pare don. They would scream it like thunder coming from a thunderstorm, whereupon the tribunal officer would order the man to be executed. They would haul the officer down to the poles, tie him to the poles, and the firing squad would execute him. These trials reminded me of the Christian trials. The only difference was that during the Roman days, they used animals, lions and tigers. Whereas in Cuba, the communists under the leadership of the butcher Castro was using animals with weapons. After the trials had quieted down, I was given some communist literature to read and to hand out to the men. I couldn't believe this information that was being handed to me. Being a gullible American, I had believed all the bull that had been given out in the hills. Liberty, freedom from poverty, plenty of food, free education for all, etc. So I immediately went to Camilo Sanfuegos' office. Camilo's office was at the Esta Mayor in the big army camp in Havana. At this time, Camilo was the commanding officer in charge of the army. When I went to Camilo, Camilo told me that Fidel Castro had been a communist since 1945, that he was arrested on many occasions in Cuba for attending communist meetings and for being a member of the Communist Party. Camilo went on to tell me that Fidel Castro was also in charge of the Cuban delegation that went to the Bogota riots in 1948. He then told me that the revolution reminded him of a watermelon, green on the outside and red on the inside. We then talked about overthrowing the communists in Cuba and having free elections whereby the people could then vote into office those people that were freedom-seeking, constitutional-loving Cubans. We formed a group called the La Sombra Missionary Group. We started our training on the pretext of training men to invade Nicaragua. I was given three farms outside of Havana, and there is where we started our training. In April of that year, I was arrested for counter-revolutionary activities, whereupon I was sent to three prisons. I was at La Cabana, Principe, and the Dier. I was also at the first police station and at the prison at Ciudad Libertad. While I was being held in prisons, I was beaten and tortured and brainwashed. As an example, I can remember a lieutenant that was a Mexican national that used to put his knee in my groin, and he thought this was the greatest kicks in the world. I can also remember a Capitan Guiter who used to take a 45 pistol and slap me upside the head with it, or pull the receiver back and put it up to my head and pull the trigger, me not knowing that there was no shells in the gun. These are some of the acts that were inflicted upon me by the communists in order to have me give the information that they wanted. I one day got a hold of Camilo's office. Camilo came down that very afternoon and got me out of the Dier station and took me to Ciudad Libertad. So he then put me in prison and told me that he might be able to get me free in a few days. Two days later, he came by and told me that the adjutant general's office had started investigating all the weapons at Ciudad Libertad, the main army barracks. Well, at this time, I was 1,400 weapons short. So he told me that it would be best if I'd take a trial and get out of the country, whereupon I agreed. I went before a three-man tribunal. I was given the death sentence and 24 hours to get out of the country. I then got on the telephone and called the American embassy and I talked to a man by the name of Thompson. He was a 26-year-old boy. When I told him that I was an American citizen and who I was, he told me that I'm not interested, that you got yourself into this, you get yourself out. I had a few words to say to him and hung up. I then called Ambassador Bonzel, and I got a hold of him personally. He explained to me that the situation had been explained to me perfectly. 
whereupon he hung up. Camilo Sanfuegos then took me to the airport, put me on a Pan Am plane for the United States, and I arrived back in the States. The next morning after my arrival back in the States, a knock came on the door and a CIA agent presented his credentials to me. He questioned me for approximately five minutes. Not one time during this five minutes did he ever take a note. Upon completion of this five-minute interrogation, he told me to say nothing to the FBI about what I had told him. He also told me that I was to not tell the FBI that a member of the CIA had ever come to talk to me. Well, this seems strange at the time, but it's very plain now. I was then contacted by a member of the Immigration Department. He explained to me that due to the fact I was an officer in a foreign army, that I must have taken the oath of allegiance, therefore I could lose my citizenship. However, he felt that if I became a good citizen and did not criticize the actions of my government in Cuba and the actions of my government elsewhere and would not give the information out about what I had seen or done in Cuba, that he felt that there would be no action taken to take my citizenship away from me. So for the next two and a half years, I became a real good Kennedy-type and Eisenhower-type citizen. Not a very good American, but a real good citizen. When I would hear from my Cuban friends, either by telephone or by telegram, letter, or in person, I'd feel a little sick to my stomach because I knew that I wasn't treating them right or doing right by them or my own country. And then I read a quote from Abraham Lincoln, and I felt that it fit me to a T, and I quote, to sin by silence when they should protest makes cowards out of men. I talked over with my wife many a times about going back to Cuba or about going down into, Cu into Florida and training Cubans for the purpose of invading Cuba. And then I read a quote from Teddy Roosevelt, and I quote, I do the things I believe ought to be done, and when I make up my mind, I act. So I acted. I left for Miami, Florida, and when I arrived, I was absolutely amazed and appalled at the conditions that exist in Miami. I talked to groups that told me of being paid $200 to $250 a month by the Central Intelligence Agency to do nothing. I talked to other groups that had been given guns and boats and equipment by the CIA and ordered to do nothing until they are ordered to go into Cuba. These same people have been sitting in Miami, Florida for the last two years. All combat Cuban groups are restricted to Dade County, Florida. Any Cuban who is a member of a Cuban freedom fighter group is restricted to Dade County. And if they leave Dade County, they can be arrested and can be deported to Cuba. If these men are deported to Cuba, it's absolutely instant death. Don't say that Kennedy can't do it or won't do it because he set a precedent not long ago when he sent Perez Jimenez back to Venezuela. Other individuals told me of being stopped on the streets and searched. Houses are being searched for weapons. Cars, gas tanks are being checked continuously and constantly in Miami because the CIA and the Secret Service knows that when a combat group is ready to go into Cuba, the only way they've got of getting gas is filling their gas tanks, draining it, and then putting this gas into 55-gallon drums. So whenever they find a gas tank that's just been filled and freshly drained, they know there's a raid going on within the next couple of nights, so they then double the watches out on the keys. I made contact with three ex-members of the La Sombra group that was with me in 59. We had no arms and no equipment, but they, in return, had 20 men. So we then started contacting Cubans who were of influence. We contacted Miro Cardona of the Cuban Revolutionary Council. This man was being paid $81,000 a month by the Central Intelligence Agency for the purpose of bringing about unity between the exiles and to help the combat groups for the freedom in Cuba. And Miro Cardona told me that he was not interested in a combat group, that the only thing that he was interested in was bringing about unity between the exiles. We then left and started going door to door, person to person, business place to business place, begging and borrowing to get the equipment that we needed. 
We'd get a gallon of gas from this man. We'd get two bullets from this one. We'd get a rifle from this one. We'd get a quarter of a pound of explosives from this one, a half pound over here. And this is the manner in which we got the equipment we needed. We had everything except a boat. And it just so happened that one of the Cubans made a trip to Nassau and found a boat that was floating away. This is the boat that we used on our raids. Our first raid, we went into Pinal del Rio province. This is the northernmost province that's 90 miles from our shores. We arrived in, in Pinal del Rio province during the night. We made contact with two members of the underground and they took us near San Julian Air Base. We found out that there were no Cubans allowed in the area, that the only two nationalities of people that are on the base is Russians and Czechs. We've also found out that at San Julian Air Base, they've got MiG 15s, 17s, 19s, and 21s. We also know that they've got bombers, IL-28 bombers, 50 miles, plus nuclear capabilities. Went on in and blew a bridge. On our way out, we ran across another member of the underground that told us that he had a friend that drove a gasoline truck at San Antonio de Baños Air Base. We gave him a Minox camera and two rolls of film and sent him on his way. We came back to States and our next trip in, we made contact with a man who had the camera and the film. He told us that on the film he had pictures of seven crates that were being unloaded from a Russian cargo plane. He stated that the crates were approximately six feet wide, seven to eight feet tall, and that the top came to a funny point. He did not know what was in these crates. He went further to say that he overheard two of the Cuban pilots that stationed at San Antonio State that that's the funniest plane they had ever seen, that it had special pressurization and climatic control devices in it. He also stated that he had pictures of two of these crates being hauled into a special blockhouse that was well guarded. He also found out that the blockhouse had special pressurization and climatic control devices. He stated that he had a picture of Fidel Castro's own private constellation, that he had a picture of an SA-2 missile, he had a picture of a couple of MiG-21s and MiG-19s and an IL Bomber 28. So we took the film and the camera and told the man to do nothing to draw suspicion and we left. As soon as we got back to the States, we sent one roll of the film to one of the senators and another roll of film to a very good friend of ours. On our next trip into Cuba, we found out that Emma Terrio was murdered as he was leaving his house that his wife was taken to prison and that his four children were being taken to a communist indoctrination school. As soon as we got back to States, we found out from the offices of these two gentlemen that the films had never arrived. Well, how in hell am I ever going to explain this to Amaterio's wife and children if they live through the hell that they're going through now? How am I going to explain to them that not only does our government protect the communist butchers, that not only does our government give aid and abet the murdering communists, but that now our government, or people in our government, is stealing all the information that they can get their hands on that's coming out of Cuba for the purpose of sending this information back into Cuba so that they can liquidate the freedom fighters that are in Cuba. And because of this, and other reasons that are quite apparent to us all, I swear to you that I shall not stop my fight until our hemisphere is wiped clean of every conspirator, every one world traveler, every socialist, and every communist. And when it's all over, and we, the American people, have won our country back from the Eisenhowers and the Three K Brothers and all the other one world thinkers and socialists and murdering communists, I want some questions answered. I want to know who. Who are the traitors of our great and beloved country, the United States of America? I want to know how. How could they betray the very things that our fathers and their forefathers and their forefathers before them fought and died for? 
in order to hand down to their children and to their children's children the sacred heritages of our great America. The American people mad. What does it take to wake the American people up? Does it take your wives raped in your presence? Does it take that your children are sent to communist indoctrination schools? Does it take trials in your own ballparks? Well, if it does, forget it. For this is communism, and not one country in the last 28 years has fought out from under communism. <laughs>